on and go with me now. Amos stepped out on the scene. He's a foreigner, a countryman, a man used to rough living. He steps out on the scene in the Northern Kingdom to an affluent crowd, a crowd that was full of prosperity. And he said this, that the Lord roars from Zion. The Lord roars from Jerusalem. Now you've got to understand that a silence fell over the crowd. A silence fell over the crowd because the people thought that they understood that God was in Israel. But according to the text, the scripture lets us know that Jeroboam had separated the northern kingdom from the southern kingdom over 200 years ago. And he set up false worship centers in Dan and in Bethel. So now Amos went on to pronounce judgment to uh, the surrounding areas. He pronounced judgment from Damascus on over to Moab. And these nations surrounded Israel. And he pronounced judgment because of their abuses and their mistreatment. I can just imagine that in the crowd, there was a great sense of rejoicing. Get them, God. Get my enemy. Yes, God, get the enemy. But Amos turned to the people and he let them know that judgment was coming to Israel and in Jerusalem. He let them know that God was not pleased. Why? Because the sins were innumerable. There were so many sins that uh, the prophet only was able to name a few. So he talked to Judah and he said that your sin is that you have rejected the Lord thy God. You have disobeyed him. You've been led astray by false gods. Jeremiah explained it even the more. He said that the people built wide houses and they would not pay their employers. They were unfair with their wages. Jeremiah also lets us know that God said that I'm going to fight for you. I'm going to get in the fight for the poor. God walked into the fight. He said that I'm sending Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar will burn down all of Jerusalem. He will burn down their plains. He will burn down their forests. And I want you to know that God did just that. Then God said a word to Israel. So the affluent crowd had to step back and go, oh my, he's talking to us now. Why was he sending a word of judgment? Because the sins were innumerable. They were selling the righteous. They were crushing the poor. They were using bribes to bypass the, ju the justice system. They were humiliating women and abusing them. They were taking their garments as pledges and not returning them. They were drunk in their own houses of worship. Hosea said this about them. He said that the priests would get with robbers and they would lie in wait for the poor to ambush them. And then Hosea said that the merchants would use their scales on, to, to add more weight so that the people would have to pay more. So now, in our text, we understand that God was saying, woe to them that are at ease in Zion. Or better, how terrible it will be for you who lounge in luxury and you who are secure in Jerusalem. You see, God was sending the Assyrians. The Assyrians had a, a special war strategy. When they came to fight, they would take out the affluent crowd. They would take out the ruling class and they would spread them all around the Assyrian empire. God was coming and his strategy was, you, I'm going to take out the affluent. So the question is, what must we do to avoid this judgment? What must we do? Well, God has left an answer in Amos chapter 5 and verse 6. He said, seek the Lord and ye shall live. Seek God and ye shall live. Saints, we got to go back to praying. Oh, we got to go back to praying. Pray. We got to pray. We got to pray. We got to pray. We got to read the Bible. We got to fast and pray. The Bible says we'll see if we seek God that we would live. Here is the other remedy. Here is the other remedy. In Amos chapter 5 and verse 14, it says seek good and not evil. Now, when we open the altar, we all probably have to go to the altar for this because God says you're going to have to do something. you got to seek good. Oh, my, my, my. You see, God is concerned about those who have no voice. He's concerned about those who have a little. 
inner voice. He's concerned about the babies in the womb that are being aborted. God is concerned about them. God is concerned that in our race that seven out of ten children are born out of wedlock. So we've got to do something. Those of us who are in two-parent families, we got to go to the single parent and we've got to take her to the side and we've got to say to her, we're going to make it together. God is concerned about the feeble-minded. He's concerned about the weak. He's concerned about the poor. God is looking for us to do something. We've got to take the widow under our wing. We've got to take the orphan under our wing. How many of you remember that there are children in custody, there are children in adoption agencies that are looking for a blessing? You received an overflow, but what you didn't know, somebody was praying. Somebody was praying. Someone was praying. They were praying for help. And you've got the answer. You've got the wisdom. So we got to get up and we got to do something. We got to get up. We got to get up and do something. Because God is concerned. He's concerned about the foreigner. He's concerned about those that come to our country and cannot speak the language. Sometimes we like to walk past them. In fact, we don't even see him sometimes. But I want you to know that God sees you and he sees me. And if we act like they don't exist, it matters to God. So in order for us to miss out of the impending judgment, we're going to have to seek God and we're going to have to seek good that we may live by the Lord of hosts. Clap your hands for Jesus. So then, in this powerful book, we have the announcement of judgment. We have the visions of judgment. And in our theme, we have the reasons for judgment. For Amos was fearless. He was impetuous. He was sincere and candid and making known the sin and warning of the imminent judgment. For he was a true servant of the Lord. He was not intimidated by false priests. He was not intimidated by a king. In other words, he was not in awe of the popular minister. He was not in awe of the Amaziah type. He was not, that only wanted to be spoken what people wanted to hear. But he recognized that he had to be resolute and declare God's word in truth that he was given in the vision for this cause. Amos called to repentance and the forecast of devastation and havoc of Israel shine the prophet in an unfavorable light to the people. For at this time, it was considered to be Israel's political and tangible ascendancy and success. But we see that Amos had to actually speak the word of God. So he leveled and directed judgment at Aram, Philistia, and Tyrim. These were enemies related, not related to Israel. And then he said judgment against Edom, Ammon, and Moab. These were enemies related to Israel and also descendants of Abraham. One commentary says that, that as Amos gave the denunciation and judgment of these nations, that the people of Israel were in a rejoicing state. For they recognize that these were enemy nations to Israel. And then next he brings judgment against his own people of Judah. And then next to that he brings judgment against Israel. Because the Bible said in Amos 3 and 1 that judgment was going to be against the whole family of Israel that are brought out the land of Egypt. And then as you go on you recognize that the reason that you had these judgments taking place was that the people were being oppressed and they were being exploited. You had where concerns had more priority than the God of the Bible. You had false worship at Bethel. You had Israel who had become a people of a complacent state. In other words, what happened is, is to use the known vernacular, having it going on led the people to forgetting about the God of the Bible. So in our text we see a foreshadowing of God's wrath to them that are at ease, them that are quiet on the ills and sin of society, them that are secure in their own lives and concerns. It was people that had thoughtless complacency the scripture says in Zion well Zion was 
was a place that was considered to be impervious to disaster, no matter what the nature. Samaria was considered the watch mountain, the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. It was considered the place of military fortification and strength. Now it is accurate to say that it did have much strength, but when the city finally fell, it took three years or so to subdue it. But I'm reminded in the book of Psalm 127 and 1, where the Lord said, except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Now note that them in this text, that them in this text were indulgent people. They were people that we see today, both in and out of the church. There were people and individuals and groups who had a readiness and an over readiness to be lenient with those that were shown to be living, those that were shown to be speaking, those that were shown to be joining in with everything that is anti-God. But we recognize that that word anti means against and instead of the God of the Bible. But what they didn't recognize is that judgment was approaching. They were walking in what I call a submerged reveling, not necessarily with alcohol or strong drink, but they were, as we see today, they were people drunk with indifference, drunk with the lack of interest concerning the will, drunk with the lack of it concerning the people or the things of God. Therefore, what we have here is a people who are concentrated on their own pleasures dangerously while an enemy was approaching. For people of God, it's a hazardous thing to be intoxicated with indifference. It's a hazardous thing to be intoxicated with blind complacency to the point that you can't recognize that the adversary is approaching. Well, how is the adversary approaching? He's approaching in the new normal of society where Orthodox Christianity is viewed as obsolete. The adversary is approaching where the inerrant, infallible, inspired word of God is considered out of touch and declared hate speech. The adversary is approaching where God's truth is not defined as politically and socially expedient. The adversary is approaching. For that reason, we must all understand that the God of the Bible does not operate on a regardless of what you do plan. He doesn't operate on a regardless of what you do destiny. But we must recognize that when we abandon the will of God, when we abandon the God of the Bible, then we're abandoning his divine help. Therefore, we must recognize that as the people of God, we must take on the spirit that the apostle Peter and Jude had. They were people that were spiritually alarmed. They were spiritually alarmed. And the reason they were spiritually alarmed is because they had got to the point where the word of God had endless value to them. And anytime you have endless value to the word of God, anytime you have something that has value, anytime that has something that means something to you, it doesn't matter what the fight is. It doesn't matter what the notorious opposition is. You are resolute to stand. You are resolute to contend for the faith. You are resolute to fight in spite of. For the Bible said that nay and all, all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I recognize that I have the victory. It doesn't matter what the devil says. It doesn't matter how the devil looks. It doesn't matter the opposition. It doesn't matter the social climate. But I recognize it's in Christ I live. It's in Christ I move. It's in Christ I have my being. 